Chapter 7. Jim Garfield Hires a Contractor Growing up, Jim Garfield had not been a musketeer or a lord of flash bu- Flatbush, and he never had a shark or jet experience. He was not a loner, but he was not a joiner either. He thought Boy Scout Scouts were fairies, and he disliked all sports except auto racing and fighting, and these activities were not offered on the intramural or extracurricular menus. Jim Garfield's mother enforced an ironclad rule that he always adhered to. Before he could befriend another boy, he first had to give that child a severe beating to show him who was boss. Jim Garfield enjoyed a wondrous childhood that he often reflected upon nostalgically, though he later realized that he was not a particularly popular kid, and he would sometimes reflect on the solitude that came from fulfilling his King of the Hill destiny. When Jim Garfield was a freshman at Harris County's Wilford High, The school's football team was enmeshed in a hazing scandal that caught the attention of the local press. Jim Garfield was not interested in football or the subculture that surrounded the game. He did not understand any wanting to belong to a group so bad that one would submit one's buttocks to a miniature branding iron forged in the image of the team's stallion mascot. Against the... Onslaught of dudgeons and umbrage and embellished outrage, a Rice University anthropology professor defended the practice of hazing. In the Houston Chronicle, he advanced the idea that hazing served a utilitarian function and it was unwise to banish these practices. The professor cited studies that showed that fraternities who treated their pledges harshly were the frats most likely to return to retain members. He commented that the esprit de corps only developed with harsh initiations, and he listed the Marines, Green Berets, and Navy SEALs as examples. He also noted that military academies were successful because they incorporated hazing into the curriculum. The professor's comments made Jim Garfield reflect on his 14 years on earth. No, he had never been bullied or hazed, and he won most fights, and he won the rematch of every fight he ever lost. But he had never been part of something bigger. He never had friends who were his equal. He had followers who were petrified of him and who offered him unending praise and unwavering loyalty. But he did not have friends. Despite his fond memories of childhood, he realized that he had spent a lot of time alone, building birdhouses and tearing apart motors of all sorts. Even his closest companions dodged him when they could. He yearned to expand his horizons. Jim Garfield wanted to be a member of a group. He wanted friends who were his equals. Shortly after the hazing scandal, Jim Garfield rebelled against his mother's rule of friendship. Instantly, the world seemed to open up to him. He started hanging with older kids, first at the pool hall, then at the mall, then at the skating rink, and ultimately at Ralph's Body Shop. But he never seemed to to form long-term friendships. Motorcycle accidents, car crashes, and incarceration seemed to disrupt his social network more so than they might disrupt other social networks. Jim Garfield planned to join the Marines on his 18th birthday, and it would be then that he would hope to find camaraderie and acceptance. But... An extensive juvenile record for crimes against persons and property would render him ineligible for the Corps. His twin interest of fast cars and larceny would lead him to hang with a group of auto thieves based out of Fat Pat's auto body. It was at Fat Pat's that Jim Garfield would find friendship in betrayal and ultimately bitterness. 
He enjoyed stealing cars and living the life until his best friend and partner, Chuck Liebernack, left town with Jim Garfield's fiance, a stately brunette he had loved at first glance. After the betrayal, Jim Garfield would never again steal another car. It was an activity he associated with his partner Chuck, and after the perfidy, he lost his passion for the game. Fat Pat could see that Jim was depressed, and he offered him a job inside the shop. There, Jim Garfield learned to roll back odometers and stamp phony VIN tags and ultimately to forge documents. It was document forgery where Jim Garfield hit his stride. He had never been particularly artistic or attentive to detail, so he surprised himself at how gracefully he could mimic a Montana title, a Nevada registration, or an Indiana driver's license. In his eyes, Jim Garfield was doing something with his life. Jim Garfield was 20 years old when his mother died, the only immediate immediate family he had. Fat Pat helped pay for the funeral, and the six pallbearers were all employees of his body shop. Jim Garfield's new family helped him say goodbye to his old family. At last, he felt like he belonged. Fat Pat was the father he never had, and Jim Garfield grew tight with two car thieves named Steve Foote and Danny Schmidt. Of the two, Jim Garfield felt closer to Danny Schmidt. They were briefly roommates until they both found hotties to shack up with. For three years, it was bikes and cars and beer and girls. Everyone had plenty of spending money. Fat Pat's boys led the good life. Then one night, Steve Foote shot and killed Danny Schmidt. It was not a dispute over money or drugs or a woman. A half-drunk Steve Foote took offense at Danny Schmidt for saying he drove like a girl. It was a running gag that had never been very funny, and it ate away at Steve Foote. For his ongoing rudeness, Danny Schmidt received a thirty-eight in the heart. Facing the death penalty, Steve Foote pa- painted the police a landscape of all that went on at Fat Pat's. A dozen people, one being Jim Garfield, were rounded up and eleven of them were sent to way. Fat Pat died of a coronary while waiting trial. With Tiffany on the other side of their king-sized bed, Jim Garfield dozed off thinking of David Hunter Duncan as his personal albatross. His desperate situation with his son, his declining mental faculties, and his general bad decisions made his business partner a definite liability. Yes, he was a genius in a jailhouse setting. But the outside world had more variables. It was a more complicated environment, even for someone whose mind was not slipping away. David Hunter Duncan's balance sheet registered more trouble than worth. He had to go. But Jim Garfield arose from his brief slumber with a different attitude. Ray and David Hunter Duncan were the brothers he always wanted, and the scholars had become his family. Jim Garfield thanked the God he never believed in for allowing him to do his stretch at a prison where Ray and David Hunter Duncan were winding down their longer sentences. Despite his lack of clerical skills, David Hunter Duncan had managed to land a desk job at the prison. There, he was able to peruse the resumes of new convicts. The more proficient, the more serious, the more skilled were ultimately stationed in David Hunter Duncan's cell block. G. Ward was called the university, and the inmates were called scholars. Being situated in East Texas, they got the occasional jewel thief, an art thief, and a few brainiacs. But mostly, they were hard luckers and -and up-and-comers who had shown a lot of potential. From this scrap heap, 
David Hunter Duncan assembled a group of dedicated criminals who were willing to share their knowledge in a supportive environment. Jim Garfield was proud to be included. The scholars did not dine on lobster and brie, but they did have an endless supply of beef jerky and candy bars and sparkling water. They read prison-approved books about military history and contraband books about true crime. The art and science of criminology was the topic du jour seven days a week. I can't believe you're a documents guy was David Hunter Duncan's original assessment of Jim Garfield. With his meaty biceps and Popeye forearms, no one figured Jim Garfield as a gentle forger. He would impress his friends with his already vast knowledge of all things outlaw, and David Hunter Duncan would treat him like a younger brother. This is a circus, my friend, and there are two kinds of performers, clowns and acrobats. An acrobat was someone who performed crime as a livelihood. A clown was someone who killed his wife. The circus metaphor was unending. David Hunter Duncan referred to high flyers and rope walkers and lion tamers and sideshows and kitty clowns. Jim Garfield later realized that it was during his prison stretch when his personality gelled. The flux cooled and the bonds hardened. He saw things completely different when he hit the streets, and he often thanked his fellow scholars for all that they had taught him. On the outside, Jim Garfield was fortunate enough to land under the supervision of a hypomanic parole officer named Ulysses Johnson, who immediately helped him launch a new career. Jim Garfield stayed in touch with the scholars who awaited their own graduations and sent money to their families. He chatted with other graduates online, and of course, Ray and David Hunter Duncan became permanent fixtures in his life. Jim Garfield rolled out of bed and pounded his bare feet over tile and wood and linoleum to grab a Pepsi from the kitchen fridge. He did a cursory ten minutes of bag work and then took a quick shower. He grabbed a handful of anonymous cells from his bedroom closet and gently kissed Tiffany on the forehead. He then hopped into a nondescript sedan and scrummed with Houston traffic for two hours until he reached his Regal Estates office. At his office, Jim Garfield scoured community supervision records to find the current address of a convict named Billy Jake Carver. Sure enough, Billy Jake Carver had landed back on the streets of Houston. He lived not far from a utility player who worked for the anonymous organization headed by Ray and David Hunter Duncan and Jim Garfield. In a Clint Eastwood voice, Jim Garfield called Lloyd Boyd. Lloyd Boyd had never met the people he worked for. He performed a multitude of tasks for the organization, but mostly he was a recruiter. Recruiters delivered cell phones to the doorsteps of prospects without being seen and without leaving DNA or fingerprints or other evidence. Today, he would answer his phone on the second ring and accept his mission from the Clint Eastwood voice. He would remove a gift-wrapped cell phone from a trash barrel on the outside on the side of his house that was always left empty. He would then deliver the package to the doorstep of Billy J. Carver, who lived in a seedy apartment complex about a mile away from Boyd's house. When his anonymous employer called shortly after dark, Lloyd Boyd answered, Mission accomplished, in a Steven Seagal voice. Jim Garfield had never ordered a contract killing before. He did not have an intact protocol for the performance of this duty. The business he ran with Ray and David Hunter Duncan did not recruit hotheads or freelancers. They deemed certain parties high risk for getting into trouble and inadvertently exposing the whole system. They might turn snitch if pressured or the police, or the police might find something in their house or car that could lead them back to the organization. The organization did not require a lot of muscle. 
They did not advertise their policy, but if an employee mishandled his balance sheet on a regular basis, they were quietly let go without violence or fanfare. But Jim Garfield had maintained a short list of prospects should he ever need anyone to pull the trigger. Billy Jake Carver came to mind. Billy Jake Carver was big and white and stupid. He had been sent away for an incident where he threw his girlfriend through a plate glass window and severed her spine. He had gained notoriety throughout the prison for starting conversations with, I like to become a professional hitman. Most of the cons smirked behind Billy Jake Carver's back, but David Hunter Duncan laughed right in his face. Carver charged David Hunter Duncan, but who put him down with a spear hand to the eye. Carver's eye recovered fully, but he was immobilized for a short time. It was the only time Jim Garfield witnessed David Hunter Duncan in any sort of scrape. Jim Garfield spent his afternoon with Ray and David Hunter Duncan, and the committee would scramble to schedule deliveries and harvest their revenue from their myriad bank accounts. As the sun started to set, Jim Garfield announced to David Hunter Duncan, I'm going to make a call about that thing we talked about. As the other two men broke for dinner, Jim Garfield crept his truck through side streets and industrial parks as he summoned Billy J. Carver on the newly delivered phone. Billy J. Carver's cell had been pre-programmed with an Archie Bunker synthesizer. He answered after two rings, and Jim Garfield used his dirty, hairy synthesizer to ask him point blank if he still wanted to be a professional hitman. Archie Bunker replied, Yes. Jim Garfield then asked Carver if he could recruit three other reliable crew members, and he said, I think so. Jim Garfield then asked if he would accept a 10% down payment of what was not an especially large sum of money, and Carver Coom Archie replied, Can you call me back in five minutes? The police are knocking at my door. Jim Garfield was glad to hang up. He slithered his truck into a remote parking area of a remote industrial park and collected his thoughts. Carver was still stupid. He was accepting a job for a murder contract from an anonymous voice while the police knocked on his door. He remembered a line from the friends of Eddie Coyle. Life is tough. It's even tougher if you're stupid. Carver would get caught if he went to Mississippi. No doubt about it. The police might follow the crumbs back to the East Texas prison where they had all done time together. But Carver was never a scholar and the trail would probably end there. Jim Garfield reconsidered his options. Yes, it could be get messy, but what else could he could be done? He did not have a yellow pages packed with skilled hitmen, and he was fearful of what David Hunter Duncan might attempt on his own. He drummed his fingers and scanned the thinned out parking lot. He was outside Sullivan and Associates at a spot where the receptionist probably parked. Whatever Sullivan and Associates did, they did not do it very much after the sun went down. There was a Lexus and a Lincoln Park close to the building, and only a couple of lights were tar- turned on outside. Jim Garfield had kept the motor running so as to keep the cool air circulating. The temptation to send Billy Jake Carver after his own business association flashed once more, and Jim Garfield quickly banished the thought. He crept out of the parking spot and redialed Carver. Hello? The Archie Bunker voice answered. Are you still there? Are you still there? The dirty, hairy voice inquired. No. They're parked outside. They're calling in permission to search, but the dumbasses don't need no warrant because I'm on probation. Let the stupid cocksuckers come in. They won't find shit. I done sold the jackhammer to Eddie for $15. Jim Garfield breathed slow and deeply. If we sent you a GPS, do you think you'd get your crew all the way to Mississippi? If it means pulling the trigger, I can find my way to any place in Texas. But you see, 
Mississippi is outside of Texas. It is? We'll send you a GPS. Gotta go. The man's back. Jim Garfield shook his head and headed back to the office. If Billy Jake Carver could stay out of jail for a few more days, he would receive weapons and money and a portable GPS on his doorstep. He was about to attain his destiny, and Jim Garfield was pleased to assist him in reaching his full potential.